Hey guys, Rainer and Shades here, exercising my what the hell's going on. Hey Shades, I've taken over your green screen. <laughs> Atticus, what the hell are you doing? I was taking a walk and saw a sign that said ghost portal and found a way to infiltrate your green screen. And yet you look to be in your room. This sounds stupidly contrived. I'm not sure I'm buying this. Dude, it's Halloween. Nothing's supposed to make sense. Right. I think I'm going to step away from the green screen. I was originally going to make a video for Halloween and not that I want to blame you or anything, but I'm not feeling up to it right now. Oh, oh shit, dude. I'm sorry. What were you working on? Something about ghosts and stuff. You find Finally tried getting into ghosts again? Uh, no. I was feeling nostalgic as I tend to. Right. And was binging a particular favorite of mine. Oh, I get ya. You wouldn't mind if I embarked this with you, just like with Dead Monkey, would you? Sure, that sounds swell. What good is being a nostalgic hard if you don't have anybody to be a nostalgic hard with? After all, that's what made the Hey Arnold video so fun to make. But I still don't think I'm going to use the green screen. I'm kind of spooked out by it. Hey guys, Rainer and Chase here, exercise my first Memorize rights vlog style. Happy Halloween, boys and girls. Today, I'm joined by my favorite death meddler and yours, the one and only Atticus the Death Meddler. Hey everybody, this is Atticus the Death Meddler, and happy Halloween to all of you ghouls and ghosties, slashers, and big titty goth girls. Anyway, in honor of Halloween, we're going to be talking about ghosts. Remember last summer when Butch Hartman made the bold declaration of creating our childhood? Yeah, that was dumb, wasn't it? But to be fair, aside from creating a show that's basically the family guy of Nickelodeon, which I enjoyed a good bit during the latter half of my elementary school years, the other show he's best known for creating that I enjoyed just as much, if not more than Fairly Odd Parents, is the show we're going to be talking about today. Danny- Did somebody say my name? I guess I did, but we're not talking about you. No, I'm pretty sure you were talking about me. I mean, why wouldn't you be? I'm pretty sure we're not talking about you. Are you positive? Because, I mean, look at me. I'm fucking adorable. Look, unless your last name's actually Fenton and you've been going by a fake name this whole time and you have ghost powers that came as the result of your parents building a very strange machine that was designed to view a world unseen when you were 14, I'm sure we're not talking about you. Not everything's about you. Get over yourself. Yes, it is, because I am the mighty Blue Mages, and everything is about me if I say so. And I do. I do say so. Okay, you want to prove me wrong? Why don't you go out, catch a ghost, and get back to me once you do so? Well, if that's what it takes, I'll go get my jumpsuit. Be right back. There's a wall there. What the fuck was all that about? Don't worry about it. Anyway, Danny Phantom is an action slash comedy slash horror show about a teenage boy named Danny Fenton who becomes half ghost as the result of an accident with his parents' ghost portal and uses his ghost powers to fight ghostly enemies that escape from the ghost zone into the real world. Isn't that basically a TLDR version of the theme song? Yeah, kind of is. Part of the reason why the theme song is so cool, especially compared to other cartoons that had rap intros, is because it tells us Danny's origin story in a way that you can get an understanding of his motivation and character no matter which episode so it comes on. And I can also play a genty version of it on guitar. He's a renter. This is a show that came out at just the right time. I was 10 at the time of the first episode, Atticus was 12, and it wouldn't be that long later until I started going through that phase kids go through where they start puberty and think that they're too old for cartoons. Danny Phantom had some pretty mature themes and storylines that weren't as simplistic as a show like Spongebob or Jimmy Neutron, so it served as a bit of a transitional aid into my teenage years, kind of like Drake and Josh also did. Danny Phantom was indeed a kick-ass show growing up in middle school at the time, along with Spongebob, The Fairly Odd Parents, and Billy and Mandy, make sure to watch Watch my top list after this video. Those shows were the shit at the time, but Butch Hartman made another show that involved a lot of action as well as the same humor and silliness we all know from Hartman's previous show. The show brought out a lot of interesting villains, character development, and the humor that Hartman had with his previous show involving our favorite buck tooth pink shirted twerp and his fairy godparents. It's a shame, just like with Shade's situation, that I did not care about that show while growing up with the times, but now that I have those nostalgia feels, it does not hurt to watch some episodes to relive those good old times. 
So in honor of Halloween, I figured I'd come on here and share with you my top 10 favorite episodes of Danny Phantom. These episodes are what I find to be some of the most memorable, and the ones I always enjoyed watching back in the day, as well as the ones I enjoy watching whenever I decide to binge the show. Also, just to let you know, I'm not including the ultimate enemy in this. If I didn't include the journal in my Hey Arnold video, what makes you think I'd include that spectacular TV movie here? Let's begin. Number 10. Oh, 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 shit. You okay, man? Yeah, 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 Shades. Um, I've just been feeling kind of overwhelmed lately. I mean, starting a new job, trying to be consistently active with videos, scouting for concerts, trying to keep in shape. There's just so much I need to do. I feel you. It reminds me of my senior year in college when I was balancing school, my senior project, an internship, band shit, and however much time I could dedicate to videos. I don't think there was ever a moment where I didn't do so much as slightly ponder the logistics of being able to clone myself. Imagine how much the world would advance if there was an effective way to do that. I'd have so much time to- to start things off, here's a Season 2 episode, Identity Crisis. The premise of this episode might or might not be explained in a later entry, but I'll summarize this the best I can. Danny is gear enough to have a fun weekend with his best friends, the cut-up tech whiz Tucker Foley and the snarky goth voice of reason Sam Manson, which is definitely a reference to... <laughs> and he's hoping he won't have any ghosts to fight. But while he's clearing space on his computer's hard drive, he accidentally releases Nikolai Technus, a ghost who controls technology, who is without a doubt my favorite villain on the show. So when Technus escapes and becomes more high-tech and powerful, Danny decides to use his parents' ghost catcher, which we might or might not see again later in this video, to split himself into two people, one being his superhero side and the other being his fun-loving teen side, and they are both heavily exaggerated. The superhero Danny sounds a lot like Christopher Reeve's Superman, and the fun Danny is basically Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High, minus the drug use. Things seem to be going okay for a little while, but superhero Danny still isn't able to defeat Technus. He ends up crossing paths with fun Danny at a carnival, and gets fun Danny to penetrate Technus's shield to power him down. They get into a little tizzy, and superhero Danny realizes that splitting himself in two might have been a mistake. So he tries to fuse back with fun Danny, but ends up just overshadowing him. When that proves to not be sufficient, Tucker and Sam use the ghost catcher again on the two Dannys, and... It doesn't fuse them back, but there's still two Dannys, only they now look identical. So Tucker and Sam need to distract his family so they won't notice this. And when Technus comes back into the picture and seizes the power from the Fenton's house, the two Dannys realize that they only have half their powers, so the only way they can beat Technus is if they work together. Tucker and Sam then arrive with the Ghost Catcher, and not only split Technus off from the technology, but send the Dannys back through it and make him... What I find so interesting about this episode is how different the two Dannys act and how they're just unable to function properly without each other. The reason is because they both lack in logic and common sense, and as a result, they are not being productive and end up causing more harm than they do good. And while individually the two of them are really funny, when they're able to work together to fight Technus, their interactions with each other are pretty cool, especially when it looks like fun Danny is getting a boost in common sense. Like I said, Technus is my favorite villain on the show. Despite sounding an awful lot like Gilbert Gottfried, he's actually voiced by the amazing Rob Paulson. He's got an iconic voice, and throughout the series, he's got some really funny lines and some really funny gags. Brace yourselves, folks, because you're going to be seeing a good bit more of Technus in this list. This episode best describes what can go terribly wrong when you make the decision of splitting yourself in two. I think we can all agree that we have the fantasy of having another half of us working and taking care of other stuff while you just sit back and relax. My life outside can be very busy and overwhelming. I mean, I just started my new job as a web designer, which is a great step ahead from being an inventor technician, as well as keeping up my gym routine and taking care of my dog Herschel. All of that can be overwhelming when I'm trying to make plans like want to dress up as for Halloween, how much money it would cost for the costume, as well as making and saving up for concert plans either in my area of Jacksonville or two hours away down in Orlando. I think Danny learned that splitting yourself in order to make your life easier will complicate things very fast. Also, I swear to God, I don't know which Danny was worse, between Super Danny or Stoner Danny, but I fucking love this part. <laughs> Looks like that guy's butt already has it covered. Danny? Lighten up, guys. It's a free country. Besides, what can a guy with a wet butt do to us? Not much, unless he's the manager. Whoa, lover. Now stay out! Number nine. So before I talk about my number 9 pick, let's talk about Vlad Masters, aka Vlad Plasmius. 
Technus might be my favorite villain on this show, but it's Vlad who's the most notorious, as well as the most prominent. Not only is he cunning and sadistic as hell, but we actually get a good bit of backstory about him. He made his first appearance in the episode Bitter Reunions, where Danny's parents, Jack and Maddie, take him and his older sister Jazz, or Jasmine, to their college reunion, hosted by Jack's ultra-rich college buddy Vlad at his mansion in Wisconsin. We learn in this episode that in college, Jack and Maddie studied ghosts along with Vlad, and Jack caused an accident with the ghost portal they were testing that not only infected Vlad with ectoacne, but also gave him ghost powers. Despite accumulating his wealth, Vlad spent the next 20 or so years completely bitter at Jack for not only causing the accident that got him hospitalized, but also for winning the affections of Maddie. I mean, it's not hard to see why. I mean, um... Danny's mom has got it going on. Danny's mom has got it going on. Yeah, yeah, she's a total MILF, and I say that as someone who doesn't even get off to cartoon characters. Sure. Shut the fuck up, or I'll tell Stout about that stash you have of his hair. Don't ask how I know about that. Anyway, Vlad was determined to one day get revenge on Jack, win Maddie, and upon discovering Danny too has ghost powers and has been defeating ghosts that Vlad himself had been sending after Jack, getting Danny to turn on his father and join him. For the remainder of the series, he became Danny's arch nemesis. But that's not the episode we're talking about. What the fuck? You are setting that stage so well. That episode is a major turning point in the series. If you didn't put Bitter Reunions on the list, what did you put, Shades? I'm glad you asked, Atticus. I instead opted to give this spot to the episode where Vlad makes his third appearance, Maternal Instinct. So in this episode, Maddie receives an invitation to a mother-son science symposium hosted by the Dolph Group. Ah, you see where this is going? Which she uses as an opportunity to bond with Danny. Initially, Danny is reluctant to go on this trip since he was wanting to work more in developing his powers, but the plane the two of them are on, accidentally, flies in the wrong direction, and they end up landing near a conveniently placed fancy shack owned by none other than Vlad, and he makes a bold move. He confesses his feelings for Maddie and tries to convince her to leave Jack and stay with him. Because that's totally something appropriate to say to someone that's taken. Maddie gets rightfully offended, and she and Danny leave to camp out in the woods, but Danny is then kidnapped by Vlad's animal minions, and his powers get temporarily revoked. Maddie saves him and beats the minions, and Danny realizes how much his mom actually kicks ass. Maddie then puts her Spectre Deflector belt she was given earlier in the episode on Danny, which she doesn't know will zap him once his powers come back, and she decides that the only way to find a phone to call for help is to go back to Vlad's. So you know what she does? Uh-huh. She seduces him. And while she looks around for a phone, Danny gets the belt off, softens Vlad, and puts the belt on him. And he also turns the animal minions against Vlad by mentioning how he killed them for his mannequins. So they take Vlad's helicopter back home, and no one says a word of what happened. Maddie is a great character, and she's awesome in this episode. And this episode has also stood out to me as my favorite episode with Vlad as the villain. The tricks he pulls to get Maddie and Danny in his clutches are absolutely absurd. And of course, the scene where Maddie seduces Vlad always left me with such a disturbing sensation. But outside of that, the heart to heart moments between her and Danny are genuinely sweet, and the B-plot where Jack bonds with Jazz and gets her interested in fighting ghosts is so damn endearing. It goes to show that no matter how old we get, our parents can still be cool. But if you have any Vlads in your life, be they male or female, they don't deserve you or anyone close to you, and they need to accept that no means no. Fuck those people. Throughout the show, especially in the first season, we see that Danny is treated as somewhat of a laughingstock in his town due to his parents being the crazed ghost hunters. In this episode, I can relate this so well to the relationship between me and my mother. You see, my mother is by far the best woman that I know of. We've had good times, bad times as well as really dark moments throughout our relationship. But throughout the years, she's been the one woman who brought me into this world and a woman I could never hate. The episode perfectly depicts the bond between parents and their children when they get to their teens. First, they're super close, but they ultimately drift further away. And it's interesting on how Vlad tricking Maddie and Danny to fall into his trap to win them over ended up making their relationship blossom back. The same could be said when Jazz and Jack have their own bonding moments. It was comical at times, but it was still a good moment for the two as well as Maddie and Danny to really bond together. And I love how wholesome those moments were between the two. Also, Maddie was a fucking shield maiden when she took down those goddamn ghost animals. Number 8. So, there's this girl. Go on. And I have this fantasy of going inside. And? And going up to this dorky guy and telling him that he rocks. 
Oh, inside her body. Gotcha. Did you think I meant something else? Forget it. Parental bonding is one of the earliest episodes in the series, and you can tell since Danny is still trying to get used to his powers. So in this episode, Danny tries to ask out the school's hottie, Paulina Sanchez, to an upcoming dance, and his losing control of his ghost powers causes his pants to fall down, and everyone starts laughing. <laughs> this episode's also noteworthy for when Danny figures out how to overshadow people. So when Paulina decides to flirt with Danny to prove to Sam that she isn't shallow, an amulet called the Amulet of Aragon from a ghost called Dora Danny fought at the beginning of the episode episode falls out of his backpack and he gives it to her. And she says yes to go to the dance. Pretty swell, right? <laughs> that amulet turns you into a dragon if you get angry while wearing it, which is exactly what happens when Paulina is told she can't buy a yellow fleece t-shirt at the mall. And simultaneously, Danny gets in trouble with his teacher, Mr. Lancer, aka the man who substitutes his exclamations with titles of books for his pants falling down. Moby Dick! So his dad has to come in for a parent-teacher conference. So in order to not tell his dad he got in trouble, he overshadows him at the conference, and Lancer volunteers him to chaperone at the dance. At the dance, Danny tries to get the amulet back from Paulina by telling her it belongs to Sam, and this of course pisses her off. So he's caught in a pickle between getting the amulet back and overshadowing Jack whenever Lancer tries to talk to him. Sam manages to get the amulet back by apologizing to Paulina for calling her shallow. When Paulina reveals that she only agreed to go to the dance with Danny out of spite for her, she gets pissed and turns into the dragon. Of course, Danny is able to trap the dragon using his dad's fishing rod, the Fenton Fisher, and gets the amulet off, returning Sam back to normal. As far as early episodes in the series go, this one's always been a favorite of mine. It's a staple episode, since we're introduced to my favorite of Danny's powers, the ability to overshadow people by going inside their body. The scenes where Danny overshadows Dash Baxter, the bully jock, and his dad are so hilarious. Far too often we wonder what it would be like to control people if we had the power to, and these moments are some of the most memorable. Lancer is also funny when he tries to speak in hip vernacular, and the hijinks involving Danny bouncing between fighting the dragon and overshadowing Jack really keeps you on your toes with how quick paced it is. And of course, the episode's also relatable with how one typically feels when asking someone out. These characters are still kind of new to us at this point in the series, since this is only the second episode, but it does a good job setting you up for what's to come later. Let's be frank here, people. If Timmy Turner has the hots for Trixie Kang, Danny Fenton has the hots for the Latina version of Trixie, Paulina Sanchez. We've all been smitten with the hottest girl in our school, work, or somewhere, and we think that we are the best fit for the opposite sex. But there is an old saying of how someone can be beautiful on the outside, but ugly on the inside. And thus, we have Paulina. One thing I love is how it looked like the Cuban Missile Crisis went hot between Paulina and Sam. Set this between a hot Latina and a goth girl. This episode is mostly about Danny learning some of his techniques like overshadowing people like his old man just to make a good first impression on Lancer, voiced by the legendary Ron Perlman. I think the biggest impact of this episode is that we think we can win the heart of our desired crush by just being super confident, pants or no pants. But little do we know that our very own crush can be a low key viper ready to break our hearts with or without the amulet number seven here we have the first appearance of Technus in Attack of the Killer Garage Sale. In this episode, Jazz bribes Dash by saying she'll go to the party he's throwing if he invites Danny. So Dash invites him, and Danny gets a sudden boost in popularity as a result. Though this plus Danny's change in attitude causes Sam and Tucker to feel alienated. The catch though for Dash inviting him is that he needs to buy some hip and fresh apparel. So Danny decides to have a garage sale where he sells some of his parents' weird ghost hunting shit. Yeah, Jack's kind of got a hoarding problem. They should do a documentary on him. Anyway, Danny ends up being able to sell everything and make enough money for the outfit, but the technology ends up being contaminated by Technus, who becomes a giant technological monstrosity, kinda like the Trapper Keeper on South Park, which I'm kinda convinced this episode ripped off. Danny goes to the party and has a miserable time, and when he goes into Dash's room, he sees Technus forming. And to make matters worse, he's able to upgrade to become even more powerful. After he apologizes to Sam and Tucker for being a lousy friend, they help him defeat Technus by tricking him into getting another shitty upgrade so Danny's able to catch him in the thermos. If there's anything we learned from Cool Party in my Hey Arnold video, it's that feeling included rocks. But when it comes as a result of compromising your friends, that's when you need to ask yourself if it's really worth it. Especially when you realize that you don't really have much in common with the crowd you're trying to fit in with. I'd rather have a small group of close friends than a large group of people I don't really talk to all that much. When I was in high school, I felt like I had quality relationships with the friends I considered close, and although I'm not as close with them now as I was back in the day, there's still people I care for very much. As for the episode, again, Technus is such a hilarious villain, and the parts that always get a laugh out of me are when Danny tells him he won't get away with his intentions only for him to reveal that he hadn't even thought his plans through. You're not going to use the technology in this lab to take over the world! What? 
That's a great idea! We've had those moments in our youth where we strive to be like the popular kids in school. I can recall having a good set of friends back in elementary school, which grew a bit in middle school, but it was in high school where I had that kind of mentality trying to fit in with the cool kids. Granted, all of us have wanted to be popular and fit in, but the price of doing that is pretty much shoving away our actual good friends. And we tend to do really stupid shit in order to impress our peers. Like Danny selling his dad's shit to everyone in town. And my God, Lancer, what the affirmative fuck. I like this episode because we learned something interesting about Sam and how she's retardedly rich, but tries to be humble and hang out with Tucker and Danny rather than be part of the herd. Danny learns a very important lesson in this episode when it comes to shoving away your true friends in order to be part of the herd. It tends to really bite you in the ass and it does kind of suck that I barely talk to a lot of friends that I grew up with in high school. Whenever I do see them in person, I do what I can to catch up with them and see how they're doing. Hell. My first high school reunion will be happening in 2020, and I'm looking forward to that. Number six. Shades, there are some times where I get kind of envious on how awesome your videos have become. Aw, oh, dude, don't, don't. I've given you so much criticism and advice on how you can better your content because I want to see you get to my level. But you see, when you say, Get to my level. That's what I mean. Oh, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I never meant to come off as egotistical. It's not like you found a genie and plan on wishing to become an all-powerful video editor. Give it time. There's a saying, be careful what you wish for, and what you want, apart from having a title that makes me think of an awesome Buster Rhymes song, encapsulates this message. So let's talk about Tucker Foley. He's good with technology and has some of the funniest lines in the episodes, but in this episode, we learn that he lives in Danny's shadow and finds himself always getting the brunt end of any ghost fight. The episode begins at a carnival where a genie by the name of Desiree gets released from her lamp. You might think, oh, a genie, neat. They're gonna fly out the wall with jokes and sing a cool song about how you've never had a friend like them, right? No. Desiree grants wishes every time she hears someone utter the word wish, and the result is some disastrous version of the wish, such as Dash becoming a monstrous quarterback and Paulina becoming some mix of Hello Kitty and Mr. Sparkle. Fuck's sake, the cat's even called Sayonara Pussycat. I wonder what that's a reference to. So when Tucker gets fed up with getting the short end of the stick, he wishes he had ghost powers. And while he could be using his powers productively, he instead uses them to goof around, be a show-off, and of course, spite Danny. And when Danny expresses concern for the powers going to Tucker's head, Tucker sweeps it under the rug as him just being a jealous buzzkill. And as he becomes more and more powerful, his spike gets so out of whack that he actually turns on Danny. When Desiree is summoned by a guy wishing for a million bucks, she reveals to Danny that Tucker's jealousy will overtake him to the point where he becomes the most powerful half-ghost. Danny catches her in the thermos, but then he has to fight Tucker. So he lures him back to the lab by taunting him and sends him through the ghost catcher that we talked about earlier. Tucker then sees how twisted and fucked up he became as a ghost and makes up with Danny. Fighting with your closest friend is rough as fuck. One of you might think you're in the right, but when you take a step back and allow yourself to be self-critical and bury the hatchet, that's always wonderful. It reminds me a lot of the period of time after Repgate when Skullripper 4900 didn't talk to me for a while. When him and I patched things up in April 2015, it felt wicked great to be back on good terms with someone I saw as a great friend and still do to this day. Though that's not gonna stop me from ragging on him for his grammar, much like how I also do to Atticus here, or pestering him to come back to making videos, or bringing up how he lives a secret double life as the bassist of Coed and Cambria, and how he won't be a bro and introduce me to the band. I still love you, Skull. But anyway, this episode is such a standout, not just with the comedy or even the tension between Danny and Tucker, but there are some cool slow motion shots like when Tucker fires at Danny in the chemistry lab and when he passes through the ghost catcher. I'm not sure if I like or dislike the first person narrations we hear from Tucker. It'd be one thing if the show had a premise like Doug where there's always a narration, but this is one of the only times we hear it. But on the positive side, it provides context to how exactly Tucker feels at various points in the story. He doesn't go out of his way to say he hates Danny, he just feels annoyed, which says to me that even when the rage was overpowering him, he still had some kind of sense. This is an episode I do remember fondly when it comes to Danny Phantom. The most that I took away from this episode is how friendships can be extremely fragile. Tucker's jealousy over Danny's ghost powers, as well as Danny being concerned about Tucker's powers when they were getting way out of control. Ultimately, their friendship got to a breaking point. We've all we all experience toxic friendships once or multiple times in our lives. And trust me, toxic relationships with your friends, 
family, and even your intimate partner are the worst. Friendship is not that easy, and it takes two to tango on a lot of issues. But when you have friends that stick up by you and help you better yourself, and you return the favor, those are the friendships that really do matter. And this is why this episode sticks out to me as one of my favorites. Number five. WHY IS NOTHING HAPPENING?! Here's another episode with Desiree as the villain, as well as the first episode of Season 2, Memory Blank. Paulina invites Danny, and reluctantly so, Tucker and Sam to her quinceanera that's taking place the night of a meteor shower. Sam gets upset because she was hoping the three of them would see a crossover monster movie, and says this. Unless something should happen to Paulina, and then the party got cancelled. Not that I'd wish that. So because she did so much as utter the word wish, Desiree brings the three monsters to life. When Danny defeats one of them, who's a female parody of Predator, he asks her who sent her, and she says, Sab. So because he doesn't want anything supernatural and ugly happening to Sam, he gives her the Spectre Deflector belt we saw earlier. Then the second of the three monsters, who's basically a female goth Terminator, attacks, and just as Danny gets trapped by her, Sam saves him. Instead of being grateful and thanking Sam, he subtly blames her for all these ghost attacks. They get into a fight, and Sam then says this. There are days I wish I had never even met you! <laughs> And again, because she said the word wish, Desiree makes it so Danny never met Sam. Fortunately, Sam was still wearing the belt, so the magic didn't affect her. But here's the kicker. You know how in the opening theme, the lyrics say that Danny took a look inside the ghost portal to figure out why it wasn't working? Apparently, it was Sam who convinced him to go inside in the first place, as well as taking this goofy patch of Jack's face off of his jumpsuit. Can you imagine if you wore that? So as a result of this, Danny doesn't have ghost powers anymore. And with him not being a threat to Desiree during the meteor shower where everyone will be making wishes, she pretty much has it in the bag to become super powerful. After Sam takes out the third of the three female ghosts, which looks like a fat chick cosplaying as Freddy Krueger, she's able to convince Danny that maybe there's some truth to what she's saying about him knowing her. So what she does is recreate the scenery from when Danny first got his powers, along with giving him a cool new logo, and thus Danny Phantom is back. Kinda. The wish isn't exactly reversed since he doesn't remember how to use his powers, but while everyone's making wishes at the meteor shower party, Sam does something she could have easily done ages ago and wishes that she and Danny never had the fight that caused her to make the first wish. And as we all know by now, even doing so much as saying wish in a sentence means Desiree has to grant it, so everything turns back to normal and Danny beats Desiree. The setup and plot to this episode is not only unique and interesting to the show, but it also shows how important of a person Sam really is to Danny. It does borrow a lot from It's a Wonderful Life, and while some might call that cliched, I'm really kept on my toes because we want everything to work out and for Danny to not be an averaged weeb, let alone one that can't recapture what he once was. One thing I also like is the picture montage of Danny's memories coming back to him when Sam makes her final wish. It sends us on a bit of a nostalgia trip to some of the classic fights he had with enemies like Skulker, Vlad, and the rest. Similar to what you want, it's normal for even the closest of friends to fight. But as Mortify Productions said in my Hey Arnold video, true friends are able to salvage the situation and keep arguments from getting out of hand. Sam is one of my favorite characters characters on the show, not only because she's a beautiful goth girl, but also because she's a very good and close friend of Danny. In this episode, their relationship sours when Danny, of course, is like a moth to a lamp with Paulina. Having her be irrational, wishing that she had never met Danny, really does bite her in the ass, and she realizes the mistake that she's made with Desiree granting everyone's wish. She understands the consequences of her wish, and at the last moment of the episode, by wishing Danny had his superpowers and memory back. This could apply to anyone that you hold close to you in your lives. You'll never know what'll happen when you make a very fucked up wish like that. The ripple effect is very powerful. Number four. In micromanagement, Danny and Tucker are both failing gym and bringing down the class average, so the coach pairs them up with more athletic students so that they'll be able to pass that president's fitness test I remember only having to do in middle school. Tucker gets paired with Sam, and Danny gets stuck with Dash. Skulker, who is known for hunting ghosts for himself, is also hunting Danny down, and when Jack sees all the ghost action outside, he uses his newest weapon, and Danny, Dash, and Skulker get shrunken. Not only that, but Danny's powers get shortened by the shrinking, and every time he exerts strength, he loses part of his ghost identity. So he and Dash need to work to get to the shrink ray while avoiding shit like Jazz working out and Jack practicing his putt-putt golf, as well as Skulker still trying to hunt them down. By the time they get to the shrink ray by climbing a slice of pizza, Danny utilizes enough strength that he reverts back to Danny Fenton, but thankfully he gets unshrunk, stuffs Skulker in the freezer, and unshrinks Dash. And having gained some experience in fitness, he's able to pass the fitness test. This is a really funny episode. What I like about it is the environment of being shrunken, and Dash is also hilarious, especially at this part when they go inside a mouse hole in the house. 
What kind of mouth hole is this? Where's the matchbox sofa and the coffee table made from a spool of thread? You watch way too many cartoons. It goes to show that whenever he's not being a jerk, he can be funny and even sensitive. And while he doesn't know that Danny Phantom is really Danny Fenton, and he's basic enough to buy anything Danny tells him about why his identity is reverting, he really comes through and helps Danny utilize the giant environment and become fit. Dash isn't exactly a character we're supposed to like as he is a pretty typical bully character, but kinda like with Harold on Hey Arnold, I say kind of because Harold is a much more developed character, he has his charming moments and micromanagement has a lot of them. Oh, Dash. That fuckboy was always annoying as shit throughout the series. I cannot help but to think that him and his Asian buddy he hangs out with looks a lot like Bryce Walker and Zach Dempsey from 13 Reasons Why. But I'm getting way ahead of myself here. This was indeed a good episode on how two characters who don't get along that all actually band together in a stressful situation. It's kind of like capitalists and communists banding together to fight off the Third Reich. How silly! In the case of Danny, he puts aside his disdain for Dash in order to get him back to normal size, and that's a noble thing to do. Also, it kind of irks me on how Skulker was voiced later in the show by Kevin Michael Richardson. I prefer his first voice actor, Matthew St. Patrick. Like, what the fuck, bro? Number three. Shades, I forget. Why aren't you a gamer again? It's mainly because video games were never really a huge part of my life. I don't really have a distinct taste in games, outside of very small few that I mostly have around for nostalgic purposes, and I don't keep up with all the gaming news or the latest in consoles and all that jazz. Not to mention, whenever I first heard about the whole console versus PC debate, I got really turned off and just wanted to keep far away from the subject. Oh, I could have sworn it had something to do with being a Nazi! If you heard that from who I think you heard that from, I'm going to break something very important of yours. No! If you're referring to what I think you're referring to, you ain't going anywhere near it! Another episode with Technus as the villain? Fuck yes! In Teacher of the Year, Danny and Tucker are really into an online RPG called Doomed. Danny develops a sleep pattern not very different from my own as he stays up all night gaming and falling asleep in class. Dude, I miss college. <sighs> Me too, bro. Me too. He not only fails a poetry test the next day, but Technus is also freed and is intrigued by the design of a character in the game called Chaos that Danny and Tucker have a hard time beating, so he redesigns himself as he plots to utilize technology again to take over the world and stuff. So Danny has to blitz between getting rid of Technus, who escapes into the game, trying to beat Chaos, who turns out to be Sam the whole time, and studying to retake the test for Lancer, which is actually a bigger deal than it sounds given how vital it is to his final grade. Meanwhile, Technus is somehow able to trick Tucker into teaching him some moves in the game. Danny ends up passing the test and uses his ghost powers to go inside the game since Technus did the same thing after all, blaze through the levels, weaken Technus, and trap him in a glitch. This episode reminds me a lot of the World of Warcraft episode of South Park in the sense that the characters are basically part of the game, and there's some unstoppable opponent that everyone has to work together to weaken. It's such a fun episode, and the action that goes on in the game is entertaining as hell, and of course Technus is goofy as fuck, especially when he tries using such out-of-date lingo like hip and far out and funky fresh and other stairs typically 70s bullshit. I remember fondly on how it was the cool hip thing to have all the cheat codes at your disposal while playing video games back in the day. I also remember how royally fucked I was when I didn't prep up for a major exam. Face it, all of us really had and dread subjects that we did not care for in school. For me, it was math. Math was literally Satan in the flesh for me. But with patience and hard work, as well as help from fantastic tutors, I was able to pass all of my math classes all the way through college. Danny, despite the impending threat of Technus, ended up passing his exam with flying colors and grew to appreciate the importance of his education later in life. We all have our moments with a school subject that we hate, but later on in life, we really appreciate on how much they matter to us. Except algebra, what the fuck was the point with that? Number two. At number two, we've got My Brother's Keeper. In this episode, the school gets a new psychologist named Penelope Spectra, whom Jazz refers Danny to as she thinks he needs an outlet for the acting out he's been doing. Right as Spirit Week is approaching, the advice Spectra gives seems to be making the students at Casper High, yep, you know what that's a reference to, more miserable than psych. Like, she tells Danny Jazz thinks he's a loser. The fuck kind of psychologist says that? The reason the kids are becoming miserable is because Spectra is absorbing their energy so that she and her assistant, Bertrand, who reminds me of a professor I had in college and whose voice reminds me of Felix Wolf can appear more youthful. Yep, 
their ghosts. And Jazz sees Danny fight Bertrand, who's basically Beast Boy as a ghost, in the flesh. So she not only now knows ghosts exist, in their world anyway, but she also sees him go ghost when Bertrand shows up at the mall. But no matter how much she tries to get through to Danny and get him to open up to her, he's distrustful of her because of the comments he thinks she's made to Spectra. Eventually, Danny, Tucker, and Sam start to wonder why everyone at the school is so depressed, and Danny suspects that it's ghost-related. He wonders if the cold breath he was seeing with the heat turned down was actually his ghost sense, and that's when his suspicions of Spectra prove to be correct. She and Bertrand plan to vaporize Jazz when she gives her pep speech so there's enough misery to keep them... When Spectre reveals her ghost form, she tries to appeal to Danny's emotions by calling him names that she knows get to him. And after Danny saves Jazz, she steps in with her dad's latest invention, the Fenton Peeler, and uses it to decompress Spectre to her true form, and thus Danny is able to suck her into the thermos. There is so much emotion to this episode, I almost tear up by the end. We're given so much to take in with the relationship between Danny and Jazz. Scenes like the one in the kitchen where Jazz tries to get Danny to open up about his secret are very heartfelt. It's obvious she doesn't think little of Danny, a good sibling wouldn't do that. She's just trying to look out for her brother who's having some hard times, especially since she now knows the root cause of a lot of his behavioral problems. The two things that get me the most about this episode are, one, how even though Jazz now knows about Danny's ghost powers, she plays it off like she's oblivious for Danny's sake and then saying, he'll tell me when he's ready, and two, the crowd cheering for Jazz at the end when they all get their positive spirits back. It's like, Fuck, this episode wants me to cry. To go along with that, there's also excellent emotional buildup in the fights Danny has with Bertrand and Spectra. Oh, look, the little loser ghost has a few baby helpers. Do not call me a loser! Man, I am so tired of you dumping on me. And I am so tired of dumping on myself. Jazz never did that, even when I was mad at her. And I won't let her down! With all this going on, My Brother's Keeper stands out to me as one of the best episodes of this show. But if you know me, you know exactly what's keeping this out of the number one spot. This is another episode that I am very fond of. As someone who has two brothers in his life, these are the kinds of themes I can totally relate with. If you're an old subscriber of mine, I too was in a very dark state of my life, in my early stages of high school, and thus I required some hardcore therapy. I was resentful at first, but later down the line, I was really thankful for all the time I spent with my therapist, though he was not an evil ghost in disguise like in My Brother's Keeper. I also recommended my little brother to the same therapist. I do also take this episode to heart when it comes to siblings. My older brother helped me out throughout some of the shit that I dealt with in life and stuck up for me on so many occasions, and I've done the same with my younger brother. At times, I do worry that he may go down a dark path with the friends that he hangs out with, but I do know that at the very end of the day, he does want some assistance, and I do what I can to help him push through his struggles. He's now a senior in high school, and I I cannot help but be super proud of his future endeavors, as long as he cools down with being a party animal and have a fair balance in his personal responsibilities. Hell, I too have some problems sometimes, and my little brother can pitch in to help. I know I'm his older brother, but sometimes it doesn't hurt to have your younger brother return the favor sometimes. And the same applies to my older brother. Also, I love how Lancer talks about his school spirit, which reminds me of myself a bit when I was in high school. Those of you who are from my class in high school summing upon this video, you knew I blew the horns like none other. As with any positive countdown list, there's always a bunch of stuff you want to include but don't have room for. So before we get to my number one, here's some honorable mentions. First is Doctor's Disorders. In this episode, a swarm of ghost bugs causes an epidemic among the kids at Casper High that causes them to not only feel sick and get hospitalized, but also develop ghost abilities. Tucker's sporting what he thinks is a cool cologne, and it ends up repelling the bugs from affecting him. So despite him being afraid of hospitals, he and Danny infiltrate the hospital and find that no one's being offered any explanation as to what the fuck's going on, let alone any real care. And it's all part of another plot by Spectra and Bertrand to extract young people genetics to look beautiful and insert Alphaville reference here. There are some pretty funny moments in this episode, like when we see the kids having ghost powers and Tucker looking for some excuse to not go in the hospital even when Danny gets captured. Let me go! Still, technically not a cry for help. Help! Well, not a cry for me. Tucker! Ah, dang. It's pretty weird at times, but this episode sticks out to me as an enjoyable and funny episode. We all at one point in our lives have to get through our fears head on. As for me, you'll understand once you check out the video we put up on my channel. If you all do recall on my channel, I had a double hernia throughout the course of this year. And when the day came for the surgery, I was pretty damn scared. Scared that shit would go terribly wrong. But I managed to actually do well after the whole ordeal. Minus the tremendous pain and nausea and the two week 
recovery. And it was great knowing that Tucker could face his fears of hospitals in order to save his pal in the end. My second honorable mention is the Million Dollar Ghost. In this one, Vlad's ghost portal blows up because he never bothered to change his ectofiltrator and his mansion gets destroyed. So he offers a million dollars to any ghost hunter that's able to catch Danny Phantom. And while he has everyone distracted and doing his bidding, as well as laughing at Jack being his usual goofy self, he plans on stealing the Fenton's ghost portal. The thing I always remember about this episode is the parodies of Men in Black, who become more prominent antagonists later in the series, and Scooby-Doo, which are funny as hell. And there's this third group that has a name that sounds like it's a parody of ghost Ghostbusters, but they act more like the kids in Rocket Power. The other aspect of this episode that warms my heart is when Danny offers to turn himself in to Jack so he can redeem himself and get a self-esteem boost, as well as when he informs Jack of what's going on with his ectofiltrator that also needs to be changed, and Jack sets him free. And when Jack gets home and fights Vlad, he shows he can be a good ghost fighter if he only asserts himself. This episode I can really relate well in regard to the relationship with my father. I see this episode as the father version of Maternal Instinct. My dad can sometimes be a pain in the ass and too much of a headache, but I know that in the end he means well. Though he does not go to the lengths Jack does of embarrassing me throughout the show, that's for sure. Jack is a very idiotic character in this series, but I like how he stood up for himself, his family, as well as redeeming himself at the end, kicking Vlad's ass. Though I felt like half of my brain cells fell out of my head with that rocket power duo. Sheesh. Next to my honorable mentions, I picked Masters of All Time. In this episode, Vlad gets infected with ectoacne again and tries to get Danny to help him by infecting Tucker and Sam. Jack and Maddie take them back to the house to treat them, but they're missing a key component to the cure. So Danny decides to talk to a ghost called Clockwork, who, as the name suggests, is the master of time, who we're introduced to in The Ultimate Enemy, about going back in time to the good old ladies to prevent Vlad from his accident that gave him ectoacne and thus his ghost powers in the first place. But as we know from other time travel plots, if you ever travel back in time, don't step on anything, because even the tiniest change can alter the future in ways you can't imagine. And boy did he fuck things up. Now it's Vlad who marries Maddie, and also becomes the new Dairy King, and Jack who suffers from the accident, so he's the bitter villain with ghost powers. The only way Danny can fix everything is to go back to the ghost zone and find clockwork, and the only place he knows that might have a portal is at Vlad's. So yeah, we have to see Maddie make goo goo eye with him. I am so sorry. But they actually do have a portal, which is a secret Maddie kept from Vlad, which kinda shows that maybe she shouldn't be with someone she has to keep a secret from. Maddie catches Danny, and when Danny reveals to her that he's her son with Jack, Jack arrives and reveals that Vlad lied to her about him blaming her for his accident, and that he's still in love with her. So they help Danny get through the portal, he gets clockwork to fix the timeline, and he realizes that the missing ingredient to cure the ectoacne is soda. As freaky of an episode as this is, it's still an episode that jumps out at me. It's definitely my second favorite episode with Vlad, after Maternal Instinct. It reminds me a lot of Back to the Future 2 when Biff marries Lorraine as a result of his meddling with the past. But one thing that jumps out at me that differentiates this from other time travel plots is how Danny is able to get Maddie to realize Vlad was a liar and she was meant to be with Jack, and she would have loved him even if Danny wasn't able to go back to clockwork and fix everything. If there was one thing I would fix from the past, it would be Julius Caesar not destroying a good portion of the Great Library of Alexandria. Cause holy fuck! Fuck, did that send human advancement a thousand years back? Aside from my grievances of fixing the past, a lot of shit can really alter and fuck up when you try to save the ones you hold dear to you. You save a guy who has a creepy crush on your mom, but end up making your dad the bitter one. It's an important lesson we learned that if we try to fix our mistakes in the past, some really crazy shit will happen in the present. Also, my dad. God, did Jack and Maddie look cringy as shit when they entered that nasty burger joint. Oh my god. My fourth honorable mention is the Fenton Menace. Lovely Star Wars reference there. And hey, it's another episode with some first-person narrations, this time from Jazz. In this one, Danny is fighting an obnoxious ghost kid by the name of Youngblood, voiced by Taylor Lautner. But only kids can see him. So to Jazz, it looks like he's fighting nothing and he's channeling Mike Moir. I'm not crazy! He just wanted his Pepsi, goddammit! So she suggests the family go on a camping trip in the desert and not worry about anything ghost related. Everyone seriously thinks Danny is crazy for seeing this ghost, even though I thought all ghosts were supposed to be invisible. But eventually Jazz is able to see Youngblood once Danny appeals to her inner child by annoying her. This isn't the first appearance of Youngblood, but it was the first episode I saw with him as the villain, and he's great in this episode. The fact that only Danny seems to be able to see him provides some different aesthetic to the idea of ghosts. He's such an annoying kid, but not everyone can see how annoying he is, and the way Danny was able to 
to prove to Jazz that he isn't crazy and that Youngblood does exist is also very endearing. Of course, this is the point in the series where he basically knows that Jazz knows his secret, though it doesn't really become official until the end of The Ultimate Enemy, which was the next episode in the series canon. Either way, it's painfully obvious she knows at this point. My god, was Youngblood annoying as shit. But it's kind of a freaky episode when you think about it. It sort of reminds me of the film A Beautiful Mind, which I strongly recommend watching. It's a film about John Nash, played by Russell Crowe, a well-known mathematician who suffers schizophrenia. The film accurately depicts how fucking terrifying and messed up mental illness can be. Only on this episode of Danny Phantom, Danny is not clinically insane, and he has to prove to the best of his abilities to both his friends and Jazz that there is a ghost that only children can see. This also reminds me that children can actually see ghosts rather than adults. That's just from what I know when it comes to the paranormal. Fun fact! And for my final honorable mention, I picked Secret Weapons. At this point in the series, Jazz is now helping Danny, Tucker, and Sam fight ghosts. However, she's being a bit too helpful to the point where Danny ends up getting fucked by the weapons. She's doing unnecessary research about ghosts we already know plenty about and getting the box ghost's name wrong. I got the Creep Creep! Creep Creep? I am the Box Ghost! Who are you? Well, seriously, who is she? And because of her incompetence, Skulker ends up getting away with the Fenton's Ecto Converter that converts ghosts into fuel. When Danny finds out Jazz hacked into his computer to look at his files on Skulker, he blows up at her and she ends up running away. Where? To Vlad's. She basically pieces together that Skulker is in cahoots with Vlad and helping him build a Super Soap! And when Skulker captures Danny and brings him to Vlad, he becomes suspicious of what Jazz is up to, so he makes her fight Danny to prove her loyalty to him. She puts on a really convincing fight, and Vlad ends up getting tricked. This is another episode where I really like the change in relationship between Danny and Jazz. Although Jazz is embarrassing as hell in the first half of the episode, it's nice how she's able to find her footing and do a great job manipulating Vlad. Also, I like how it says in the title card, Beware the Twisted Sister. I remember the PMRC saying the same thing in 1985. We get it, Shades. You like glam metal. Like, I totally did not see that Twisted Sister reference from a mile away. Man, is Vlad getting a lot of love and honorable mentions. Too bad it ain't for Maddie, huh? This is another good episode, much like My Brother's Keeper. Once your sibling knows that you are a half-boy and half-ghost fighting ghosts and shit, she wants in on the fun, but does the worst way possible. Sure, Danny is a bit of a dick at first with Jazz, but by the climax of the episode, he knows that Jazz can be of help and a big asset to his ghost fighting. But my god, she was so bad with the puns, as well as the cringy ass drawings of the ghosts. But I think the worst was getting onto Danny's laptop and browsing through his ghost files. At that point, if I was Danny, I would be all, it's time to stop. Number one. Atticus, I need to know. Do you remember? Remember what? Do. You. Remember. What am I supposed to remember, Shades? Her name. You mean Lord Moldybutt? Hello, Lord No, the only name that matters. Yes indeed, you knew this was coming. The episode with the uh, big titty goth GF villain, the one with the catchy rockin' tune, you know it, you love it, fanning the flames. So in this episode, there's a new teen singing sensation sweeping the nation by the name of Ember McLean, and she has a hit song about how you will remember her name. Pretty typical of pop acts to just pop out of nowhere, make a big splash, and have a whole mass of people fall in love with you. That's basically what happens with everyone at the school, well, except for Danny and Sam, who aren't affected by this musical brainwashing at the hands of Ember. When she asks, who do you the crowd goes nuts, and the more they cheer her on, the stronger she gets. And her plan is to broadcast her upcoming concert globally so that everyone will fall victim to the music and no one will forget her name. So in order to keep Danny from being a threat to her plans, she strikes a chord that causes Danny to fall in love with Sam. But you're over there, and I'm here waiting. And like we sort of established, Sam isn't affected by this since she's wearing specialized Fenton earphones that are essentially blocking her ears from the music. She's eventually able to break the spell by having a fake out make out with Dash, and Danny then engages in probably my favorite fight scene with Ember. The spell is broken by Tucker doing a killer Davi vanity impression and Ember losing her power. Say my name! Say my name! You acting kinda shady, ain't calling me baby. 
Say my name, baby. Let me talk a little about the Ember song. The lyrics might not make sense, but does anyone care? <laughs> nope. The song kicks ass. Even at 11 years old, when I was barely starting to develop a music taste, I thought the song was awesome. And normally I really don't care much for episodes of cartoons with musical numbers, but with this one, you can't go wrong. And just to add on to the swellness, it's in A-flat major, the relative major of my favorite musical key of all time, F minor. And of course, Sam's reaction to the Ember craze pretty much reflects the attitude of your typical hipster. You mean like us? Atticus, we're nuanced. I don't think I've ever seen nuance in a hipster. Anyway, to get back on track, Ember is an awesome villain. Of course, since her shots come from her strumming a power chord, that just leaves me going, YES! Even with some really corny music references, I can't help but smile. And the episode's also noteworthy for flirting with the idea of Danny and Sam having feelings for each other. As if we didn't already live in an age where every character ever is shipped with each other. Don't think my opinion on fanfiction and DeviantArt's changed at all since I made that quip in the Hey Arnold video. Regardless, it's still kinda nice, especially during the part where Danny takes Sam flying out of the school to find Ember. Tucker, as usual, has some really funny moments. And of course, this guy's awesome. Will you be my friend? To think this character inspired an insane person like Randy Stair to commit a shooting at Vice Supermarket. Look it up when you have the chance. It's insane. It's good to know that I look up to female metal musicians like Simone Simmons of Epica, Elisa White Glues of Arch Enemy and formerly of The Agonist, Christina Scabia of Lacuna Coil, Elise Ridd of Amaranth, Liv Christine, formerly of Leaves Eyes, Charlotte Wessels of Delane, Angela Gosso, formerly of Arch Enemy, and so much more, who are all 10 times better than Ember in my opinion. I find it super ironic that Ember brought out the anti-establishment height when the bitch was totally a corporate sellout like that of Rage Against the Machine. But like Shade said in his What's Wrong With on them, If you can't beat them, show them. This was also indeed a very important moment for the characters of Danny and Sam. As much as they say they're not dating and are just good friends, sometimes most of those relationships actually take to a whole nother level. They have good chemistry, know each other very well, and help build each other up. That's what makes them pair up very well. Yeah, I know. I put a spell on Danny, but outside of that, the two of them look like that they did have a thing for each other, which I found beautiful in the sense. Still, please check the link on the description below onto Rainbot's video on Randy Stare if you want to learn more about this crazy fuck. It's insane. Hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you, Atticus, for accompanying me. You're welcome, babe. Hope you guys have a great Halloween too. Whatever you're doing, whether it be going to a party, marathoning horror movies, or watching this and other videos on YouTube, I hope you enjoy yourself. I'm dick! Shit, I forgot all about you. Hey, I'm used to it. I mean, ever since YouTube buried me, everyone kind of forgot about me. Remember, Shades, you told him to go catch a ghost so he would leave us to do this video. Ah, yes, and I caught one. Oh, yeah? What's its name? You see, the, the funny thing about that is, um... I AM THE BRAX GHOST! No, no way. way! You caught the fucking box ghost! <laughs> uh, yes, I did indeed catch the box ghost. It was remarkably easy, too. I mean, it was literally just I put an empty box there, and it was just a sign that read, Free box! And then I kicked him right in the neck. He's a ghost, so it, it didn't break. Damn, I guess I was wrong about you. Yes. You were indeed wrong. You were wrong about a lot of things. Really? What else have I ever- and he's gone. <sighs> you okay, man? Yeah, I'm fine. I just need to rethink my perceptions of reality. Take care and have a nice day. I'm Shades. And I'm Atticus the Death Meddler. Be sure to subscribe to Atticus the Death Meddler and check out the top 10 we did on his channel about the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy. Have a happy and safe Halloween, and I'll see you next time. Also, one more thing. If you encounter any spooky ghosts, try not to get covered in ectoplasm, okay? Because that's just not going to be pleasant.